Okay, we'll see how many gigabytes this recording is. Oh, Caleb, I, yeah, so I was just asking, I see in the chat window you asked what I had said. Uh, I had just asked to see if you had video, uh, but I'm if, if you do or don't. Hey, Kyle's on, that's cool. Ah, all right. Caleb says the house is in in the process of cleaning. You got it, like a carpet cleaner's coming in or something. Spring cleaning. We need to do that at our house. Ah, oh, Matthew Tam is on.
Olivia, Olivia's on. All right, so uh, we still got a couple of minutes here, but uh, if if you guys can turn on your video if you have it, and if it's convenient and if you're willing and and all that, uh, it's so much nicer for me to get to see you guys. Uh, so if you have it, can you turn it on? Ah, there's Matthew. Okay, well, uh, I think just Matthew has the the video on at least uh you know matthew i wouldn't so i request if you could just leave it on i wanted to tell all you so we'll start a little bit with the background professor mcguire's here that's awesome I, one of the reasons why uh we moved to this format is i really want it to be more interactive and so that's why i asked you to turn on your video because there is nothing worse than trying to talk to an empty room and uh these videos that we make I got to tell you, it's a dry slog and there's no feedback and you're just talking to nothing. And it's like you're, you know, broadcasting on a unused frequency. And I, I honestly got to tell you, it, it worsens the quality. And so I really thrive on um, interacting with students. I really want to know that there's somebody out there, not that people just logged on and then, they're, then they went off and they're playing Xbox or something like that. I like to know that there's somebody on the other end of the horn. Uh, and and honestly, it does contribute to the um, the quality. Well, I don't know, we start very, very high quality on, on my lectures, but um, it really does help. And I think this interactivity uh, is also better for the learning environment. In and through all of this stuff, you guys, it's very disruptive. I know for you guys having to get scattered to the wind and you're sitting there at home, I'm sure that you're feeling isolated, that you're kind of feeling like we're tossing these assignments at you and just uh, saying, good luck, do it on your own. That's not the case. And so we're working to try to do everything we can for interactivity and so that you guys don't feel alone. Uh, I, I, I hear the term social distancing like seven times a day. I hear social distance. Oh, no, stay. And what people, people have stopped, you know, thinking about what it means, they, they equate it to uh, staying six feet away from other people. But I think there's a real cost to this whole thing. I know we can't do anything about it. Uh, but when I hear social distancing, I think about disconnecting us socially. And that's one of the real barriers, one of the, the drawbacks to this whole thing. Sure, we can't do anything about it. Uh, but social distancing is more about staying away from the slobber of other people. Um, it really has an effect, I think, um, on people in that we're we're disconnected socially. We're disconnected as people, and I hate that. Um, so I don't want you to feel isolated, and I want this to feel like a um, an interactive uh, type of situation. Whatever we have to do, and we got a couple of uh, people that just just logged in. One of the this screed that I started here. If you didn't get a chance to hear it, um, if you can turn on your video, if you have it. Uh, I would really appreciate it. I was talking about just how, you know, everybody's feeling kind of distant, and I want this to be um, as interactive as possible. And I think it's helpful then for your classmates uh, to get to see each other. You're used to sitting in a classroom, talking to people, and so forth. So um, the more connected we can get, uh, I think the better it is. Okay, today we are talking about sorting, and sorting is going to be pretty much the subject for the uh, the rest of the semester. Uh, there's two reasons why sorting is um, a good topic. Number one, it's a very well-established, a well-researched uh, method of taking one task and seeing how you can do it in uh, a dozen different ways. And by taking a look at the different ways that we can do the same task, we can evaluate the trade-offs and benefits 
of different choices in our software design. The second thing is you do sorting all the time. You just don't realize it. Uh, and so sorting is a fundamental uh, uh, task in software uh, that you, you probably don't even notice. So here's an example of sorting that you probably never think about. You open up an Explorer window and you're looking for a file. And usually uh, it might default to uh, like it has everything in the list by date. And you say, no, no, I remember the file name. Uh, and I know the file name starts with an N. So what do you do? You click on the top, you click on name, and then all of a sudden it sorts it by file name. And then you can go down and you can find it. Sure, uh, that would be a very, uh, and, and that's a very useful task. But I mean, think about it. The computer has to run through some sorting algorithm and, and you click on it, it happens instantaneously. So that's a very useful thing. And uh, any sort of, I know people don't use encyclopedias and dictionaries and, and, uh, and so forth, they are phone books anymore. But think about if a phone book was not sorted. If a phone book was not sorted, then it wouldn't be very useful. Or if you wanted to add, uh, let's say you had a town, and so whenever somebody new moved into town, what do you do? Well, you just stick the new person at the very end of the phone book. Well, that wouldn't be very useful. You got some things sorted, but then if you don't find it there, then you got to go slog through the uh, new people section of the, the phone book. So having things sorted makes things easier to find. And if you're looking for a particular bit of information, you don't want to take a long time to be able to find it. So if we can sort our input, sort our data, then it makes it much easier to index. We kind of talked about that with the hash tables last time. Okay, so you probably sort things all the time and you probably don't think about it. And I have, are, are you guys seeing the, you guys seeing the overhead here? Okay, you see the overhead. Yes. I forgot that, so I had switched over that check-in to make sure with, uh, with uh, Caleb and Daniel uh, to make sure it was visible. But uh, let's say that I had this array of cards. And um, if you are going to play cards, what do you do? You usually, when you're dealt the cards, you usually have some sort of organizational system. And depending on the game that you're playing, usually the rank of the card matters. And so uh, when you're dealt the hand of cards, you have to sort the cards so that they're easier to access and easier to play and so that you can um, be more effective in the game. So this would be an example of, oh, I need to sort these things. Now, we as humans probably don't use a very mechanical, methodical way. And if we only have, in this case, seven different cards, you just kind of ad hoc, switch them around and so forth. But I have never forgotten my sophomore second computer science class. Uh, the one that was equivalent to this, because in this class, I learned a sorting method, and I realized that I had been using that sorting method my entire life. Or uh, Whenever I played cards, I used a sorting algorithm, and I didn't know what it was called. So I want to tell you, like, if you get dealt the cards, you might, okay, I'll move things around and so forth. Uh, but we want to have a methodical way to do it. And the computer is a little bit more tricky, because in a computer, we, uh, you know, in our hands, we can just move things around. But in the computer, you've got either a pointer-based system or you have an array-based system. And with the array-based system, there's only one number for every spot. And so it's not like you can just kind of scatter them around. So if I did have my cards and I was going to sort them, if I picked up a wad of cards, there's a couple of things that I could do. I'm trying to keep these visible. I know there's some shine. Um, you'd say, you could say, okay, let's see, the five, that's pretty small. I'm going to move it over here. And then, okay, the 10, the 10 is really big. I'm going to move it over. And you kind of use this ad hoc method. I'll tell you how I always do it. When I get uh, a, a hand dealt to me, I just leave it on the table. Okay. I leave it on the table. And what do I do? I take the first card. And now I need to sort that first card. I got to sort this. Hey, that's easy. My job is done. There is only one element. And so therefore, the one element that's already sorted. So then I pick up the next card and I look at it and I say, here's my hand. Here's my next one. It's an eight. And so what do I do? I put it over here. OK, I draw the next card and I look and it's a five. 
and I sort and I move it on through and I say, oh, it needs to go right here. And now I've sorted it. So I'm gonna add one more. And I look at this and I start over at the end. And I say, oh, two, okay, that one goes right here. I do a next one. Okay, now that's kind of in the middle. So I, you don't notice exactly what you're doing, but I, you know, uh, if I try to describe it, I move the, this new card over until it gets to the spot that it's supposed to be. And as I do this, my card gets, my hand gets bigger and bigger while I've got more and more work to do. But I keep my hand sorted. I keep, now my entire hand is the, the whole set of cards, but I keep my temporary hand, my running hand, sorted as I go. And I always, I always start over here, and then you move that card over, you move your card over, you move your card over, move it, move it, move it. Oh, okay, that goes right here, okay? Then I look at my last one, and I go two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It goes right here, okay? And then now my hand is sorted. But it's this idea that I have a sub hand, a running hand, that I keep sorted at any given time, and then I add one more card to it. Or you can say that I insert one more card into my running hand. And so I didn't know this at the time. I did it, you know, ever since I was playing cards. And this is a well-documented algorithm, and it's called insertion sort. This is insertion sort, and we use it all the time, okay? What if I get my cards again, and I get dealt? Now, let's say somebody else takes a look at uh, the hand, and they take the whole hand. And so then they've got these. What would be another way of doing this? Well, I've seen other people arrange cards like this. They scan their cards and they look for the smallest one. And they say, okay, that's a two, that's the smallest one. So I'm gonna tuck it all the way over here. And you kind of put some space here so that you know that's your, that's your uh, the sorted part. And then you scan through and you look for the next minimum value. And you scan through the entire one, you say four. Four is my minimum. Four is the minimum. I'm going to stick that over here. Now, since we're doing this successively, my kind of my sorted part of the hand is always sorted. Then I go through and I got an eight, a six, a ten. What's the minimum? The five's the minimum. And I move that one over to move that one over to uh, the end. So I kind of got it in my mind, keep track of what's the the pile that I'm, I'm the, the portion that I'm trying to get rid of and the portion that is sorted. So I scan through what's the minimum, I take the six. Scan through, I take the minimum, that's gonna be an eight. I scan through, I take the minimum, that's gonna be a nine. I scan through, oh, there's only one left. I do that and then I've got, then I've got a, a sorted hand. I'm gonna ask, I know the frame rate's a little low and the resolution might not be so good, is this is this visible okay to you? You can type in the chat window or you can pipe up. Um it's like it's easy to see it when you're when you have it still, but uh, when you're like moving the card around, sometimes it kind of freezes up for a little bit. So it's uh it's like a little hard to see that, but um when you're talking about it too, like it's easy to imagine like what you're doing because like it's yeah. frozen on uh on the card so okay uh thank you thank you for that feedback i'll try to hold it a little steady and i'll try to not go as fast because i know the frame rate's an issue i'm stuck at home and my up my upstream speed isn't as good but uh hopefully you get the analogy right when you sort cards you know you, you probably do something like this now i wanted to ask the group does anybody else use a method that's different than those two when you're playing cards or if you want to sort your card hand here yeah i mean i just look at the uh entire hand and then i kind of go from like left to right um uh moving them around like that and uh i look at like the leftmost card and i say all right where does this uh like and then i compare it to the other cards from the right over okay so you i'm going to try to uh, do it as you explain it you take the leftmost card which is a six. I'm trying to hold this steady. Right. And then what do you do? Uh, it for I don't know about. Uh, oh, okay. 
So a six, um, I see, like I look at the other numbers and then I see that uh, six averages to be about in the middle of these. Okay. Uh, so you throw it. Yeah. Okay. And then That's reasonable. Nine seems to be one of the bigger ones. So I'll grab the nine. And um, for now I can put it uh, like uh, maybe all the way on the end. Okay. And then I see that 10 is the greatest one for sure. And it outranks the okay. nine. I, I don't see this uh, maybe translating well into code per se, but this is how I would just how I do it. Um, okay. Two seems like the smallest it can stay where it is, be, or okay. I'd move it all the way to the left. Um, and then we've already messed with the six. So yeah. I would go over to the eight and uh, I'd move it over uh, to the, like, um, a little further over just past the five. Okay. And then the four would move to the left past the, like, the other side of the six. Uh-huh. And then the five would also move past to the other side of the six, and then I would have, have moved, like, every card at this point. Yeah. Now, what you're describing, that that's actually a thing, um, and we'll get into that called shell sort. Uh, that's like a preparation. <clears throat> so I think what Matt, I, it might not be exactly what you're talking about, Matthew, but one of the things to do is kind of say, well, I know that the numbers in this case are, are one through 10, or maybe it's one through uh, queen, king, ace through king. So you already have an idea of the, the relative magnitude. So you could do a pre-processing step that you say, well, I'm going to throw everything that's between one and four all the way over to the left. And I'm going to throw everything that's from nine to nine to king over to the right. And then I'm going to put the other ones in the middle. Then it's going to be mostly sorted, right? And then I only have to do a little bit of cleanup. Yeah, that actually, okay, so uh, so we'll talk about that next time. That's like a pre-processing step. And that's a reasonable thing. Um, okay. Uh, thank you, Matthew. All right. So let's see. Now, that's just with a human looking at it. And it's with like maybe, uh, what do I got, six cards here, seven cards? That's with seven cards. Now, if you wanted to sort then, let's say for whatever reason, uh, you had a hand of 1,000 cards, 1,000 cards. Boy, that'd be tough to use kind of like an ad hoc method, right? So if you had this, you know, if you, you had this huge mitt, you'd have to come up with something methodical that would work, you know, at the end. So... Yeah, this example is is small, but we might be sorting a million different elements. And the other thing that is different about cards than the general sorting method is that cards are limited in range. So you know that everything's between an ace and a king if it's cards. So you have a fixed you have a fixed limit of the range, and so that could make things easier. But the general sorting problem is. Hey, I got number, I just got the set integers and it can go really, really, really negative or it could go really, really, really positive. So our general sorting algorithms that we're talking about today are going to be no limit on the range. Uh, integers are effectively no range. Uh, integers in a computer, you know, go from negative 2 billion up to 2 billion uh, for 32-bit integers. So we don't really have an effective range on here. So our algorithms are going to be based on comparable numbers, not a limited range. Okay, so uh, the first one that we did, and I'll, oh, I was going to say that my next thing was going to, I'll try to do it quick so you can see it. But then, of course, we got a frame rate issue here. So anyway, um, I'll try it. So if I do my insertion sort, if I do it quick, oh, I think these were sorted. I didn't mix them up. So start, and I got a six. Then the next, I got a four. It goes over here. Then I've got a five. It goes between. Then I've got a 10. 10 goes on the end. Then I've got a two. Two goes on the end. Then I got a nine. I scan through, and I put the nine in here. And then I've got an eight. And I scan through, and the eight has to go between the six and the nine. So that's what insertion sort is. Now, 
imagine we're locked into an array. So hopefully this will be easier to see on the video. Um, I've got my camera on the highest res. And now we're locked into an array, an array. Now I'm going to do insertion sort here. And insertion sort. With insertion sort, what I need to do is I need to have a fixed range. Remember in the metaphor, I had a subhand that was sorted, and then I've got my unsorted pile. However, here I don't have two piles and I can't really split them. Every number has to stay in place. So this is going to involve swaps and comparisons. So when I start, I, I pick up the two. And my first, my first time, this one's already sorted. And let me let me arrange these a little bit different. And because they started sorted here. Okay, so then I start, this is sorted, okay? I've got my sorted part and I've got my unsorted part and I'm gonna have an index. Of course, this is gonna involve a for loop and then my index is gonna go, uh, gonna keep creeping up. So you can think about this as indicated by an index when you actually encode it. All right, two's already sorted. Then I've got my thing to insert. That's the card that I pick up. It's an eight. So what I do is I compare the eight to the two, and I say, oh, okay, that's good, that's good, I'm fine. Now the two and the eight, I'm guaranteed to know that the two and the eight are sorted, and so my indexing variable would go up by one, and I know that this is the sorted part, and this is the unsorted part. Um, and then I, I hit the nine, and this is my, object of comparison. So this nine is the thing that I'm comparing. And what I do is I look down and I'm going to swap this down. But when I hit the eight, well, the nine is bigger than the eight. So I don't have to do anything. And then I know that I have my sorted part and I have my unsorted part. Now at this point, it's start, going to start to be interesting because I put some low numbers up here. So I know that this, you can think about it, the metaphor, that that's going to be the, the part that's in my hand. And these are the ones like I'm picking up. So I pick up the five. And that's my element of interest. And I want to get a subarray of four that are all sorted. So I look at the five and the nine, and the five is smaller than the nine. So what do I do? I exchange those values. I exchange those values. And I compare. I did a comparison between these two and I saw that I needed to swap. Then I go over and I compare the five to the eight and I do a comparison and I find that they are out of order. So I do a swap here. Now realize all I'm gonna do, I'm not changing the array itself at all. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to change the values. I'm gonna write a value of eight to this spot in the array. I'm gonna write a five to this spot in the array. So I have to do the comparison. Now when I go to the five and the two, I look and five is bigger than the two. So that's good. We, we're done. Okay. Now this was our demarcation point, but we know now that we have done for step four. And we know that now everything from this spot, this is our demarcation spot here. And I know that all of these are sorted. All right, let's take a look. Two, five, eight, nine. Those are sorted. We're good. All right, so this was from the last iteration. And now we inspect. It's like we pick up this card here, and now the four needs to be put into place. I compare the four and the nine. I do a comparison for these, and I'm going to have to swap them. So I swap the four and the nine. Now I look at the, the four and the eight, and these have to be swapped. Now we're not physically moving anything around. I know uh, like in the computer when you're doing your code, all you're doing is writing the values. You're taking the value of eight and writing it to this spot, the value of four and writing it to this spot. Now we do another comparison, the four and the five, and these have to be swapped. 
And then we compare, we still do a comparison here of the four and the two, but now we're done because the four and the two are in order. And our goal was to get a uh, sub array of five. So we did it. This was our element of interest. The four kind of swapped its way down. It swapped its way down until it hit the number that's smaller than it. But we're guaranteed then, we're guaranteed that this is going to be sorted. And now we have a subarray of five that's sorted. So this is all going to be sorted. Then we've got, we move to the next and we got to figure out what to do with the six. All right, what's the six going to do? The six is going to swap its way down until it hits a number that is smaller than it. So as the six swaps its way down, it's going to stop at the five. So the six is going to swap with the nine. It's going to swap with the eight. It's going to compare to the five and it's going to say, okay, good. I'm done. Now I'm in order. And we were looking at this element since we swapped it. We know that we're good up to this point. And now we got a monkey with the 10. Now the 10 swaps with the nine. Nope, uh, ten, or the 10 compares with the nine. We do the comparison and that's all good. We've gotten to the end of the array. We're good. So that's all we need to do uh, for that. And the uh, tens in place, and we get to the end of our array. Takes a long time for a human to do, but for a computer, then this would happen relatively quickly. So it's the idea that you keep a sorted sub array, and then you take a new element and you keep swapping it on down until it hits a number that's less than it. Okay. Well, as you can probably imagine, uh, you could do it the other way. You could. You could swap things to the big portions of the array. You could start here and work your way down. Uh, but for you guys to start, let's all do it that way, where we start at the zeroth index, and then we move th small things down until they're in place. OK? All right, so I, uh, me broadcasting the video will not work, will not work. And so uh, what I'd like to do is, well, I, somebody else broadcasted the video and, and it was abysmal, but let me give it a shot. What I've done is I have posted a video and I think streaming it directly to your computer instead of me downloading and streaming it to you is going to be a little bit better. But I just want to talk about it and then I'll let you watch the video. I need to share my screen. Not the screen. Okay, I'm just gonna I'm gonna let you watch this, but I'm gonna broadcast it so that you can so I can talk over it a little bit. And Trying to share my screen. So this, uh, you won't get a good frame rate on that. But uh, this is a bigger example of a large array. And then the value of the array is given by the vertical magnitude of the bar. So you can think about this as here's some small numbers. And it's going to move its way through. So this is, uh, it's two minutes long. You don't have to watch it. But what I'm going to do, I know it makes a lot of noise. So what happens is you've got a sorted sub array, and then you've got an element of interest that they show uh, being red. And what happens is it moves down until it's in place, and then this green bar moves over. The green bar moves over a little bit. So it's doing the comparison, and you can see that things kind of swap their way down. Now that's a small number, and yeah, okay. I know it's not coming through for you. So um, I'll put this in the, I've, I've posted it on Blackboard, but you can also, I'll do the chatification here. Chat.
and just watch that for like 30 seconds to kind of get a, a sense of what it uh, of what it does. Okay, uh, so I, I, what I wanted to do was bring it on back and then just highlight a couple of things. Hopefully you're still seeing my screen uh, with, the, with the bars on it. Okay, so the idea here is that we've got this section from the green on down, and you can see that it's sorted except for this new element, and that new element is swapping its way down. So eventually this element of interest will swap its way down until it gets to um, gets to this point where my where my uh, mouse is. And this hole from the green on down, from the green to the left, then that's your sorted part of the array. And you can think about just tossing these new cards into the mix. And every time you toss a new card into the mix, it swaps its way down until it gets into place. So this one, I'll play it a little bit and then, yeah, it's going pretty fast. It speeds up, but uh, but what you can what you can do and you can see is if the new element is really small, it has a long way to go. But if the new element is big, it doesn't have to swap down as many places. And so that's the key to insertion sort. And the next thing, so that's the mechanics. And then I would want to next talk about the running time of this. And hopefully you're seeing my cards again. Okay, good. All right, so now I've got a switch and those are the cards. And then Okay, so there's two things that we've got. We've got the compares and the swaps. And so with um, the compares, it's when you're looking at two elements and, you, and uh, swaps are when you actually have to exchange two things. So the cost of those is different um, because a swap involves a memory read, a memory write, a memory read, and a memory write. A comparison just looks at those two, so it uh, doesn't involve any memory writes. To it, so we might be interested in either of those. Now we always want to start with the average case, the average case, and then we'll think about the best and the worst. What is the average case? Well, in the average case, thinking about it when you're kind of in the middle, if you've got n, if you've got an array of size n, and let's say that you're at this middle portion, and this is your element of interest, 
and you need to swap it, swap its way down. Okay? So this one, in the average case, would probably have to go about halfway down. So this one would have to go halfway down, and then it would stop here. And so uh, as the end gets bigger, then you're going to go out. So basically what this ends up being is on the first time, you have to, I know this, I know it's an integer value. On the first time, you have to go down about half. And the second time, you have to go down about one. And the third time, you have to go down one and a half. That's actually this sum that we've talked about before, which is the sum, uh, this would be i over 2 as n equals 0, or it's i equals 0 to n. And so then that's going to be equal to um, n times n plus 1 over 4. And that's the number of times we'd have to go down if we have to go from the element of interest all the way down. So basically, every time you move forward, you have to do n divided by, well, if this is your i, if that's your i, you have to do i over two steps. And then i goes from 0 to n. So you have to do i over two steps, and then i increases. And if we look at this, this is n squared over 4 plus n over 4. And that is going to be big O, big O of n. Ah, I'm using capitals in lowercase. But anyway, that's big O of n, or n squared, n squared. So that's going to be an n squared algorithm in the average case. And then how many compares, how many swaps? Well, you have the same number of compares that you have as the swaps, because anytime you swap, then you're going to have to compare. Now, actually, the number of swaps is one less than the number of compares. So you have one less compare than you do uh, with the swaps because you compare, compare, compare until you find out where you're at. And that last one, when you find out, oh, yeah, I'm in place, you don't have to do the swap on that last one because then the idea is that you're in place. OK, so for insertion sort. In the average case, for compares and swaps, no matter what, you've got order n squared and order n squared. Okay, uh, You have one less swap, but if you're talking about n squared, the, the one swap that you say, not that big of a deal. All right, now what's the worst case? The worst case is if you had to go down all the way down to the, the minimum level each time. So instead of i over 2, if you had to do just i swaps. So every time, you have to go all the way down to the zeroth element. And then that would be i over 2. Well, then, what do you do? You get uh, n squared over 2 plus n over 2. That's still going to be order n squared. So in the worst case, it is a factor of 2. It is a factor of 2, but we still get order n squared, and we get order n squared as far as the compares and the swaps when we have insertion sort. When would that be the case? Let's take a look at the worst possible case. The worst possible case would be Something like this, if they are completely out of order. Well, every single time we're going to have to go all the way down. So we don't have to do anything for 10, but now the 9 and the 10 have to get swapped, and the 9 and the 10. Now we have to uh, swap down the 8. Well, the 8 swaps with the 10, and the 8 swaps with the 9. Okay, now we've got this part covered. We've got to insert the 6. Okay, swap, swap, swap. And we had to do, in that case, three swaps. We get to this two. This is all sorted. Okay. Swapity, 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 swap. Swapity, swapity, swapity. Oh, my gosh. Okay? So that's the worst case if they're completely out of order. If they're completely out of order, then you need to go 
all the way down all the time. Every time that you insert, you need to swap all the way down. And the thing is, though, yeah, it's a factor of two, but when we're using the big O notation, the constants kind of fall out of the, out of the mix. Now, let us imagine ourselves in the best of all worlds. What's the best world? Now, well, the best world is if it happens to be already sorted, okay? Now, you might say, well, wait, why would we sort it if it's already sorted? And here's the answer to that. You might not know that it's sorted. Someone might walk up to you on the street and say, sort these elements. Well, if they just happen to be sorted already, you can't just pretend or sort or hope or pray that they're already sorted. You're going to still have to go through an algorithm to ensure that they're sorted. Okay, so start with five. It's sorted. Start. Then we add in the six. One comparison, no swaps. We look at the eight. One comparison, no swaps. We compare the nine and the eight. One comparison, no swaps. We look at the 10 and the nine. One comparison, no swaps. So there's no swaps at all, and we only have to compare one each time that we go from i equals zero to n. Actually, i is equal to one to n minus one in that case. But now we see the real benefit of insertion sort. The benefit of insertion sort is that the number of compares. That's going to be order n. And number of swaps, zero. We don't have to swap anything if it's already sorted, and we don't have to do any, um, we only have to do n compares and not n squared compares. And this is the behavior that we like, and that is the redeeming, that is the redeeming quality of insertion sort uh, that if the, if it's already sorted. However, Guess what? If the array is mostly sorted, if it's mostly sorted, you're going to get behavior that's close to this. Okay? And yeah, in the in the general case, if it's kind of if it's mixed up just randomly, uh, you're going to get n squared behavior. But there are many cases uh, where your array is mostly sorted, and you just kind of got to clean it up a little bit. And that's where insertion sort is the real benefit. Uh, for mostly sorted arrays. And Matthew, that's what I was going to kind of tell you. You did a, a uh, you said you did like a precursor, right? You said, well, I'm just going to kind of throw it one way or the other, and I'm going to get it mostly sorted. Uh, and yeah, okay, that's the kind of pre-processing step to say, well, if I am forced to use insertion sort, maybe I can do an order n algorithm just kind of throwing things to get them close. Then my insertion sort will have much better behavior. Now, this is analysis, right? And it doesn't account for the real world. So you want to get something in between the best and the average, and that comes when something's mostly sorted. Uh, this truly best case is not realistic all the time. Okay? All right. So let's take a look at selection sort. Selection sort is that second... Selection sort is the second card strategy that I talked about. Yeah, I knew I was, if I wrote this on here, it was going to come off. Uh, we'll talk about selection sort here. I'll write it here. So we're going to do selection sort. With selection sort, uh, we we identify this as the concept of the champion, okay? Now, we're going to do it from smallest to largest, so you can think about it like a golf score or something that the lowest number is the best, okay? The lowest number is going to be the champion. If we take our cards and we lay them out, Here's what we're going to do. We are also going to have an iterating variable, let's call it i, that goes from 1 up until n minus 1, up to and including n minus 1. And we're going to start, and we know that when we start, the first element is always sorted. 
because it's just a single element. So 10 starts sorted, okay? Now, instead of looking at just the six, <clears throat> in selection sort, we go through and we find the minimum. We have to go find the minimum and the index of the minimum because we want to get this spot, uh, we want to get this spot here to have the minimum. I, uh, so this spot needs to have the minimum. So I'm going to move through all of the remaining elements and I'm going to say four. Four is going to be the minimum element. So I want to stop and or I want to swap and I'll swap the four and the 10. And so now I know that four is the minimum and that is going to be uh, to the, the leftmost place. Okay, <clears throat> now I move my iterating variable up one and I'm looking at this node of interest. I know that the four is in place. And so with this six, I go through and I want to find the minimum. And we say, oh, five is the minimum. So we're going to swap. We're going to select the five and then swap the five and the six. Now we know that this here is, uh, is sorted. And now we need to say, okay, what element should go in our number two spot? Well, we have to scan the rest of these and we find, oh, six. Six is the one that's in the, the spot in and of itself. So we don't have to swap anything, but we did have to do a bunch of comparisons because we had to traipse through the entire sub array that's left over in order to find the, the champion or the minimum uh, value. So six was, and so six is in place. So now we're, we're good with that. Now we gotta identify what is gonna go in the, the next space. And so we've got 10, 9, 8, which is the minimum? Oh, 8 is the minimum. So I'm going to swap the 8 and the 10. And I know that now this subarray is all sorted. Let's check. 1, 5, 6, 7. Yep, that's all sorted. And now we've got the unsorted portion. We need to find out what goes in the n minus 2 spot. So this is the spot of interest. We scan 10 and 9, and we find that 9 is the minimum. And then we swap those. And then when we get to the end here, well, yeah, okay, this is a degenerate case. We know that there's only one left, and this better be the maximum if we've done our job right. Okay. So what do we need to do in this case, or what, what's the what's the uh, the running time for selection sort? For selection sort. Uh, for selection sort. Now, in the average case, what do we need to do as far as compares go? Well, for selection sort, we need to always look through the rest of the array. So the first time, if you have an n, an array of size n, and you're looking to find this first spot, you have to look through n minus 1. And then when you've got the first two sorted, you're going to have to compare the n minus two. And then when you've got the first three so sorted, when you've got the first three, you've got to do n minus three comparisons because you've got to traipse down. So this behavior here, n minus one, n minus two, n minus three, it's the same sum that we had before. It's just going in reverse. But I still, no matter what, I have to go through this entire array no matter what. So with that, with selection sort, the average case is going to be order n squared. Okay, And you know what? In the worst and in the best case, there isn't a, a situation in which I can't which I can't scan through all of these because I need to find the champion out of a large chunk, a champion out of a chunk that's one less, a champion out of that's two less and so forth. I still have to traipse through the entire array. So there's no relief even in the best case. 
So the best average and worst case is the um, is n squared. Is n squared. Now we consider the swaps. How many swaps do we have have in this? I'm going to look at the uh, chat window. Is it just the size of the array? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and and we call the size of the array, in this case, n, right? So each time through, on the, this is the, on the first iteration, we're going to have a swap. On the second iteration, we're going to have a swap. On the third iteration, we're going to have a swap. And this is what distinguishes it between bubble sort Bubble sort is everybody loves to kick kick around bubble sort, but bubble sort has a bunch of swaps that you keep swapping and swapping and swapping. Here you say, wait a minute, I'm not going to swap. I'm just going to scan through and find the minimum in the sub interval, and I'm going to do a swap at the end. So here you look through n minus one, and then you do one swap. And here you do you look through, and you have one swap. And here you have one swap. And so you just have a swap every time. In the best case, the average case, you just have n swaps because you've got to go through and there's going to be total of n swaps. In that case, n swaps. And so in the average case, you have n swaps. And in the worst case, you have n swaps. Now, what about the best case? Hmm. In the best case, you always find the element, and then this this is just a this is just how you're counting swaps. It's whether or not you count a swap in place. So, for example, if I had a sorted subarray like, and assume this goes on, and okay. Let's say that I had sorted that I had sorted these that I had sorted all of these and I'm looking for the one that goes in this last place. And I scan through all of these and I find that 10 is the smallest. Well, I need to swap 10 with 10. Okay, whether or not you count that as a swap or not, um is uh is just how you you know it's just in general how or just definition at that point but we're going to call a swap in place the same thing as a swap and so this is the real benefit here and if you take a look at the comparison you might want to if you say what is the order of the algorithm, what is the time it takes to complete? Yeah, selection sort takes n squared on average, and insertion sort takes n squared on average. And the only benefit of selection sort is that it has a fewer number of swaps. The overall running time is n squared. And I bring that up to uh, because, and this isn't true on the PCs that you're working with, but if you had an embedded system, uh, it might be the case that swaps are expensive and compares are cheap. And in that case, uh, selection sort might have an advantage if you're on a system such that memory writes were expensive. And, and that, that does come up on certain hardware platforms. Uh, in general, though, of course, you have to do both of these. And so when you add them up for the total running time, you get n squared. And then the um, benefit of insertion sort is that it, ha that it can possibly run really fast for nearly sorted input. All right. OK, so uh, the last thing that I oh, OK, so I got a couple of uh, other videos up here, but um, but I wanted to then just share one and I'll let you let you guys um, let's see. stop sharing. And you might want to take a look at this, which is delightful. Ah, there we go. 
Oh, this is this is selection sort, but there's a couple of these, and I'll let you watch them on your own. So this is selection sort, and so uh, this is the like they're looking for the the minimum value, and then so zero is the minimum value, so zero has to go back, and then zero. Oh, here comes the swap. There's the swap, and so forth. So that's just kind of a fun way of looking at it. Uh, so the zero gets put in eventually. He's really cutting a rug there. I don't know if the music's coming through, but it's delightful. Okay, in any case, there's selection sort for you, and uh, there's an insertion sort uh, dance for you as well. So I've shared those uh, four videos up there. You can use those as a, uh, as a template. All right. Then with the, uh, I gotta be careful about sharing my screen. Uh, okay, so then I uh, just wanted to bring up the in-class exercise. Too many windows. Okay, and so this is your task for today. This is a ICE, which is due on, um, which is due next Wednesday, because we've got Good Friday off. Uh, so you've got a whole week on this, but uh, it doesn't mean you shouldn't start early. And uh, you're just asked to write the insertion sort and the selection sort uh, algorithms. And what you'll need to do is um, you'll start with just a known sequence of the arrays and you can print them out each time so what you should do is when you've gone through one of the iterations for insertion sort you'll print it out and you'll see that the zeroth element is sorted then you print it out again you'll see the first two elements are sorted and so forth and you should get a pattern that looks a lot like that youtube graphic with the vertical bars uh with the magnitudes of your numbers okay um and then get that working because with an array of size 10, like you have here, it's not too bad to watch every single step to ensure that every uh, single swap is happening. So you can do a bunch of printouts and so forth. Get it working for the 10. And then uh, later on, uh, you'll do it for 100 random numbers. But if you start with a big case, it's going to be hard to debug. Uh, and so, yeah, just work on that. Okay. And then basically the uh, the second part is with selection sort. Uh, you'll implement that. Realize that since these are order n squared algorithms, that's a strong implication that you will be needing two nested for loops, two nested for loops. And the outer for loop always goes from, well, let's talk about insertion sort. The outer for loop will go from n, I'm sorry, the outer the outer for loop of insertion sort will go from one up to an including and minus one okay and then within that you'll be doing that little dance where it so, uh, swaps its way down okay all right so i'm going to let you uh move on that and then finally the uh let's talk about next week so we don't have class on friday uh but we do have class on wednesday that is the time in which this particular in-class exercise is due we will have new content on Wednesday, uh, the exam. Exam number two will be given out on Friday. The This won't be for a while, but I wanted to let you know about it. Friday the 17th. So Friday the 17th, exam two will go out. And on Wednesday the 22nd, exam two will be due. It'll be a take-home exam, be very similar to last time. And as a special consideration to you, uh, we will just be having a review day on the 17th when we hand it out. So on the 17th, there'll be no new content. There'll be no assignment. Uh, you can ask us about the exam. You can wh whatever. Uh, but there won't be anything new on Friday. So you don't, yeah, you won't have to worry about anything new on that Friday. The only thing is that you'll receive the exam and get started on it. Questions on that?
Um, I was just looking at Blackboard and it shows that we still have the project, the programming project seven due on Friday. Is that the case if it's good Friday or not? Yeah, so it is good Friday, but it's still uh, due on that day. So you don't have class and uh, if, if you want to get it done ahead of time, uh, you can, but we've, we gave you nine days for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, Blackboard is open on Good Friday. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll set you to it. And then uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can use this as your working time. Uh, we'll, you know, nominally our class lasts till 2.10. Uh, so get a jump on this and then uh, use the time that we have. I'll be here pretty much the whole time. Well, I'll be here until the next class starts. So thanks everybody.